and welcome back, beloved. Today's video is titled, Jesus in the Torah. Jesus in the Torah. And if you don't know what the Torah is, it's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And this is just meant to be a shorter video. It's going to be like an impromptu Bible study. It's not going to be an exhaustive study. There are hundreds of verses about Jesus in Genesis, thousands in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. I'm just going to bring forward a couple clear ones. And what's really amazing about the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, they're all written about 1,500 years before Christ is even born. They're 3,500-year-old documents. They are ancient documents, and they are the very Word of God, and they reveal to us who God is. And spoiler alert, you're going to see today, he is Jesus. And so the Bible is a book that prepared the human race for the arrival of Jesus before he came. I always preach this, that Jesus is the only expected person in all of human history. And today, you're going to get a sampling of the oldest prophecies of Jesus, Jesus in the Torah. And so with that being said, let's jump right in. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I've gone over this verse many times. This is the first prophecy of the coming Messiah. Right after the fall, God could have condemned the entire human race. But what does he say? He gives us hope, and here's the hope of the coming Messiah. Now, just to give you some context, the Lord's speaking to the serpent here. The Lord is speaking to the devil here, essentially. And he says, I'm going to put enmity. I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman, okay? Between the devil and the woman. And between your seed, the seed of the devil, and her seed, the seed of the woman. Now, this is the only time in the entire Bible that her seed is used. Women do not have seed. This was typifying the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the prophet Isaiah said, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. Jesus was wrought, uh, born, you know, wrought in the womb by the Holy Spirit of Mary. He didn't have seed from a father, right? And so uh, the, the words, her seed here, uh, basically the Lord is promising that a child is coming, a seed, an offspring. And immediately we see that this, this seed is a male figure. He, it's a he, not a she, right? So he, this coming seed, will bruise the devil on the head, literally crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent shall crush him on the heel. He will inflict a wound like the devil did to Christ on the cross. However, ultimately, Christ will, the, the Messiah, the seed coming, he will crush the head of the devil. So God could have just condemned the human race, but he gives us hope. And the hope is not in ourselves. He doesn't tell us to go back to the tree and put the fruit back on it. He doesn't tell us to try and obey the law perfectly. No, no, no. He says, look to the coming seed. Look to the coming Messiah. That's a clear prophecy, right? Then there's also foreshadowings, typifying. And so what essentially happens right after that in Genesis 3.21, Adam and Eve had tried to cover up their nakedness and their shame, which is a manifestation of a guilty conscience for sin. And that's not going to cover before the Lord. That's not going to cover up our sin. We cannot create a religion or out of fig leaves to cover up what we've done. So the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Later on in Scripture, we'll see that we're spiritually robed with the righteousness of Christ when you're born again. And so the Lord is showing them here that, hey, the only way back to me is through a Messiah and through a sacrifice. This is the first sacrifice. Well, fast forward a few thousand years, I just wanted to bring you to God's promise to Abraham. He promised him a land, the land of Palestine, a people, the nation of Israel. But more than that, God promised to bless the nations through Abraham. Look at this. He tells Abram, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse, right? That's just like a national promise. But here's the gospel. In you, through your seed, Abraham, in your lineage, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You see, Paul in the New Testament wrote in Galatians that the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith, the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. All the nations were blessed through Abraham's lineage because Christ is a descendant of Abraham who blessed the nations by dying for people out of every tribe, tongue, and nation. 
Fast forward again, 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 again. Jacob is blessing the 12 tribes of Israel right before he dies, and we get to the tribe of Judah. Our Lord descended from the tribe of Judah. And look what he tells to his son Judah here. He says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? He's talking about this coming Messiah who is as a lion. Who would dare go and approach a lion? And then listen to this, the scepter, very important word, authority. We're talking about a regal king here. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. That means the one to whom all the authority comes. It means Judah will have the authority. All the kings came from Judah, right? And Jerusalem and the kingly line of David. David was from the tribe of Judah, but Shiloh is coming. Someone to whom all authority belongs is coming. And to him will be the obedience of the peoples. And he will come from Judah. Just like Micah chapter 5, this is an Old Testament prophet. Not only is our Lord arising from Judah prophesied the tribe, but the, the specific town of Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5 says, As for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. You're just a little town. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. Right? That scepter of Genesis 49. Now, Micah gives us even more clarity. He says, yeah, not only just the tribe of Judah, the town of Bethlehem, the ruler is coming. Shiloh is coming, the one to whom all authorities belong. And his going forth is from long ago, from the days of eternity. You see, the Messiah is the son of man. He's really a human, but he is the son of God, the eternal son of God. And the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament says, it's evident our Lord descended from Judah. Our Lord descended from Judah. That's why when you get to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, John is weeping because nobody can open the scroll, the title deed to the earth and all the authority in the earth. And one of the elders says to him, stop weeping, John. He's having this vision. He says, behold, the lion. Remember, like a lion in Genesis 49, like a ruler, a king, Remember, like a lion, who would dare rouse him? And so the elder says, stop weeping, John. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, he's the one who has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So that's it for Genesis. Genesis is heavy. I had to cut out hundreds. Let's go to Exodus now. Let's go to Exodus. And just to give you some context, we're already through all the plagues and they're already getting ready to come out of Egypt. They're not fully out of Egypt yet. The last plague is coming, the death of the firstborn. And look at what the Lord says. He says, I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down. So the wrath of God is coming. I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Judgment is coming. Wrath is coming. Death is coming. What can save you from it? Look at this. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. You see, they had to kill a lamb and sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And it was only the blood of the lamb that would save them from the wrath of God. Paul picked this up in 1 Corinthians. It's very straightforward. He says, Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Christ is our Passover lamb. And in fact, even more than just the Passover lamb in Exodus, when you built the tabernacle in the wilderness, and then one day Solomon turned it into a glorious temple, you know what the most common thing to do there? Twice a day on the altar, they would offer up a lamb. This is why when John saw Jesus, he said, behold, the lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The prophet Isaiah said, somebody's coming, led like a lamb to the slaughter. Beautiful. That's it for Exodus. Let's go on to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus is all about the sacrificial system that points to Christ. It's very hard to just pick a few verses out of Leviticus. The entire sacrificial system is fulfilled in Christ. But I love the Day of Atonement, and I love this verse specifically. During the annual once-a-year Day of Atonement, Aaron the high priest would lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat, 
and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel, all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he laid his hand on the head of the goat, and he sent it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. Keep that in your mind for a second. Sent that away into the hands of the wilderness. A few verses down, you'll see that they also sacrificed lambs, goats, bulls on this day, okay? And what they would do, they would take their bodies outside the camp and burn their hides and their flesh and their refuse in the fire. And the New Testament writers show us very, very clearly, the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin, they are burned outside the camp. You see, it has the idea of Christ not only paying for our sins, but then expiating our sins. Our sins are taken away as far as the east is from the west, away into the wilderness. The goat would take the sins away from the congregation of Israel. And the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament says, just like this is what it was typifying, there were those the bodies of those animals were burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Christ was crucified outside the gates of the city of Jerusalem, just like those animals were burned. Leviticus 17 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Within the law of God, it is written, something can be your substitute. Now, you need a perfect substitute. We have fallen from grace. The human race has fallen from the grace of God. We've sinned against a holy God. However, within the law of God, it reveals that blood can make atonement. So you just need, this is all you need. No big deal, right? This is all you need. You need a perfect atonement. And there's only one perfect person, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 says, according to the law, all things are cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. God's justice must be satisfied. And lambs and rams and goats, they never sinned against God. Humans did. We fell in Adam, but we can live through Christ, through his blood. Ephesians chapter 1 says, in him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption. We've been purchased back for God through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Just like Leviticus says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's how we get forgiveness. And the forgiveness is only offered eternally through the blood of Christ. Let's move on to numbers. This is just incredible. Balaam is actually a false prophet. However, God forces him to speak a true prophetic word. In the book of Numbers, it's incredible. He actually has four oracles, and I can find Christ in two or three of them, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you one. It's incredible. Balaam takes up his fourth prophetic oracle, his fourth discourse, and he says, this is the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor. This is the oracle of the man whose eyes are open, the one who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down, yet having his eyes uncovered. Big introduction. And this is what Balaam sees. It is incredible. Thousands of years before Christ is born, Balaam says, I, I see him, but not now. He's in the distance. He's in the future. I see him, but not now. I I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob is the father of Judah, from whom Christ came. The star is Christ. A star shall come forth from Jacob. And a scepter, just like Genesis 49, a scepter, a ruler shall rise from Israel and he will crush through the forehead of Moab. Literally means crush the skull of Moab, that is modern day Jordan, and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Edom will be a possession. Seir, its enemies, will be a possession. This is a ruler that comes, in, and Edom is also in Jordan. I'm not quite sure where Seir is. This is a ruler who comes, crushes the skulls of some of the enemies of Israel, and then possesses the land of his enemies. He's a conquering royal king. It says Edom will be a possession while Israel performs valiantly. If you read the book of Zechariah, at the second coming of Christ, not only is Christ reigning as a king and ruling and conquering, but the children of Israel are empowered 
through Christ. And so Israel performs valiantly. The Son of God comes back. A star comes forth from Jacob. And check this out. One from Jacob shall have dominion, a scepter, a ruler, a king from Jacob is coming. A star is coming. Revelation 22, when Jesus closes the words of the Bible, it's almost some of the last sentences in the Bible. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I'm the root and the descendant of David, who was of the tribe of Judah, a son of Jacob, right? The bright morning star. Thousands and thousands of years later, the star that that Balaam saw came, died, ascended back to heaven, and he's coming back again. And he, he gives us a revelation of his second coming. At the end of that revelation, he says, I'm that bright morning star, the one Balaam saw thousands of years ago. Well, if you're not convict, convinced, let's finish up with Deuteronomy. And there's many that we could go to in Deuteronomy. However, I want to go to the verses about the great coming prophet. Deuteronomy 18, Moses says, The Lord your God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. Moses was a prophet. He spoke with God face to face. And he says, The Lord your God, he's going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, from the children of Israel. You shall listen to him. In fact, when John the Baptist was preaching, some people came to him and said, Hey, are you this prophet? Are you the great prophet? And John the Baptist said, No, I'm not. So, the Lord your God's going to raise up a prophet from the children of Israel. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. You see, the Lord came first to Israel in flaming fire, giving them the law on Mount Sinai. And the people were so terrified of God. They said, God, I I don't want to hear your voice anymore. Go away, essentially. I'm too terrified. And it's a great example of the fact that you never want to meet God that way. You never want to meet God under the law. However, that's how he met Israel at first. And so what he's saying here is, I'm sending you a prophet And based on what you asked that day, oh, okay, uh, you know, I'm going to send you a prophet and he's going to be gentle. He's going to speak in a different way. The Lord said to me, they've spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them all that I command him. But it will come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. You see, the Lord's essentially saying here, okay, I came in flaming fire. You didn't listen to me. The fear of the Lord didn't work. Jesus came in grace and truth and gentleness and love, and they still didn't listen to that either. Jesus clearly, clearly shows that he is this prophet. John chapter 12, Jesus said, I did not speak on my own initiative. The Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what I say and what to speak. The words Jesus spoke were the words of God. He is that great prophet. He didn't come to them like on Mount Sinai and Horeb again in flaming fire. He came to them lowly, riding on a donkey. In in fact, Jesus even said this generation he went to, You know, it's like they played a dirge and you didn't mourn for like a funeral. John the Baptist came preaching hellfire and judgment and the people didn't mourn and repent. But then Jesus said, you're also as if we played a song and you didn't dance either. Jesus offered them grace and he offered them love and glad tidings of good things and they didn't rejoice, nor did, so they didn't fear God or his holiness. The law wouldn't work. They did not uh, love the, the mercy and forgiveness and grace that Christ offered. He gave them everything he had and they rejected him. He was in the world, the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. They rejected him. And and the book of Acts picks this up. They literally quote Deuteronomy 18. They say, Moses said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And then they finish with this warning, and this is how they interpret the book of Deuteronomy. When it says the Lord will require it of them in Deuteronomy, The writers, or Peter here says, it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet, if you do not take heed to what Jesus has said, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. 
My friends, I don't want you to be utterly destroyed. I don't want you to suffer the vengeance of eternal hellfire. You desperately need to hang on every single word Jesus has said and make sure that you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus, the God-man, entered his own creation in order to die for sinful people, that he rose from the dead as a sign that God had accepted his perfect sacrifice and that he ascended into heaven and he is coming back one day. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, clearly pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day.